Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this uh, end of term colloquium uh, with classes having finished a couple of hours ago. Uh, I'm sure everyone's very, very relaxed. Uh, it's really a, a great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce and to welcome uh, Dan Jurgen uh, back to MIT. He's really a great friend and also an advisor uh, to the MIT uh, Energy Initiative uh, and one of the most recognized and astute observers and analysts uh, of the energy scene. Uh, and also one with a, a real sense of history, which I think is something that really gives his books a, a, a very special uh, uh, flavor. Uh, his counsel is sought in, in many quarters. As I've already mentioned uh, the, at MIT, uh, the Secretary of Energy uh, Advisory Board, uh, where he recently worked uh, with our colleague John Deutsch uh, on uh, environmental issues surrounding uh, shale gas production. Uh, he's, uh, he's the only foreign member of the Russian Academy of Oil and Gas, and in many other venues uh, is, his, uh, his, is, is his view uh, sought. Dan, uh, I think as you probably all know, is a prolific uh, author. His 1998 book, Commanding Heights, uh, addressed the 20th century kind of tug of war between centrally controlled and free market economies. Uh, this was the basis of a 2002 uh, PBS uh, uh, six-hour documentary which earned several uh, Emmy uh, nominations and a New York Festival uh, gold medal as the best, uh, best documentary. Uh, I think his observations uh, there about the importance of legitim legitimacy of markets perhaps is something he will re readdress in his next book, given the financial meltdown of the last, uh, last few years. Um, probably his best known work uh, until now uh, is, is The Prize, uh, published in 1990. Um, uh, that was a bestseller that won the 1992 Pulitzer Prize uh, for general nonfiction. Uh, this book has often been described as an essential reading uh, for understanding uh, the history of petroleum uh, and the web of oil, politics, money, and international power. It was the basis for another PBS uh, documentary series, uh, one seen by more than 20 million uh, viewers. And now, in September 2011, we have his most recent book, The Quest. Uh, which continues this history of the global oil industry uh, through now the fairly tumultuous uh, last 20 years, and then goes on to discuss uh, issues of, of climate challenges and clean en energy technology uh, uh, advances, uh, which have in many ways come to the fore as well since 1990. This is again a bestseller, and Dan will present uh, today uh, some of its key perspectives. The Financial Times has called it a masterly piece of work, uh, my favorite, uh, however, comes from the New York Times, which, uh, after writing uh, that the quest will be necessary reading for CEOs, conservationists, lawmakers, generals, spies, tech geeks, thriller writers, ambitious terrorists, uh, and many others, uh, then goes on to provide a perspective on its 800-plus page length that reading it is like, and I quote, uh, committing to it is like committing to a marriage or to a car lease, uh, or to climbing Everest. Uh, base camps will periodically be, uh, be needed uh, as you go through the 804-page uh, uh, climb. Sherpas, perhaps in the form of your children, delivering tea, coffee, and rum will be required. Uh, so I think this is an excellent uh, vision uh, for, for the quest. So Dan uh, holds a, a BA from Yale, a PhD from Cambridge University, where he was a Marshall Scholar. Uh, inexplicably, his official biographies fail to refer to his brief boxing career while at Cambridge, something we can pursue in the Q&A. Uh, and um, in, uh, in finishing this introduction, I'll just say that while you thought attendance here was free, uh, in reality, this is only the prologue. For Friday, there will be a book signing at the MIT Coop uh, where Dan will, will sign books and give you terrific holiday presents uh, to take home. With that, Dan, please. Thank you very much, Ernie. Uh, Ernie is a great friend, a great collaborator, and I look at him again and again to find out how really to think about things. Every now and then I have to correct him, and actually if you subtract the index, the end notes, and the bibliography, it's only 717 pages, so I <laughs> wish to make that very clear. But I do want to uh, thank you. Uh, when I was, uh, the first book that I did that I was, when I was at a, another institution down the river, we did a 
book at the Harvard Business School. And uh, to my surprise, it got on the front page of the New York Times and got on the bestseller list. At that point, the publisher came to me and said, well, you know, you're going to have to start doing things. You're going to go on talk television. You're going to have to be on TV about it. And I was a shy and retiring academic. And I, with terror, said, well, what do I talk about? And they said, it doesn't matter what you talk about, dummy. Just make sure they hold up the book. So Ernie, thank you very much for doing that. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and thank both the uh, Energy Initiative and the Center for International Studies for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to be here and thank uh, so many of you for coming out on the last day of class. That's a great sign of interest in the subject. I speak uh, not only from the vantage point of uh, IHS CIRA uh, and as the author of the quest but as a member of the uh, Energy Advisory Board of the Energy Initiative. And although I was for many years a, a denizen of Cambridge, it was only in, uh, through this that I've gotten to know this institution so much better. And uh, so really very pleased and proud to be associated with it. And particularly with the Energy Initiative, uh, Ernie and I were together last week and he pointed out that there were 671 projects on this campus that are in some way connected to the Energy Initiative and it's really quite extraordinary that that's happened and so great credit to Ernie, to Bob and to Melanie for uh, this achievement. And I'm certainly very pleased that uh, John Deutsch is here. Um, I had the uh, privilege of serving on his shale gas committee which I think many of you heard yesterday. He's tough. Uh, he doesn't give any quarter, uh, but he does get it done, and, uh, and uh, uh, somebody with great respect and a great friend. So thank you for coming today, John. Uh, interestingly enough, MIT is part of the story of the quest. Uh, one part of it is something that happened here on the campus on May 6, 2005, and that was a ceremony where Susan Hockfield was inaugurated as a president and talked about the institutional responsibility to address energy issues across the energy. Uh, across the university. And I cite that in the book because it really is talking about the turn of thinking about energy and its elevation as a concern and point to that both in terms of its practical import, the energy initiative, but also as, as a kind of symbolic uh, point. And uh, indeed, I quote a venture capitalist who was at that who went back to his office and says, uh, uh, MIT is doing energy, we better do energy too. Uh, I deal in a second way. Um, with uh, venture capital in a chapter called The Science Experiment and talk about uh, General Dorio, who actually John Deutsch knew when he was a, a child, uh, who was a famous professor at uh, Harvard Business School and the course was called Manufacturing. Uh, but uh, he built and is the progenitor of venture capital, but although he was at Harvard, he built it around uh, MIT. And uh, in the chapter, I reflect on something that perhaps others of you have thought about, what makes MIT different from the other universities, great universities of the East. And actually, uh, Ernie Moniz uh, sent me to the charter of MIT to promote, uh, from 1861 to promote the practical application of science in connection with commerce. And that, too, is uh, in the book. What is interesting about, many things were interesting about General Dorio, but he's head of R&D for the Quartermaster Corps during World War II. And he said uh, a comment that I think uh, will resonate here. He said modern warfare is in reality applied science. And so it turned out was venture capital. But for many years, venture capital didn't uh, do energy. And I quote a young man who worked for um, General Dorio, an MIT PhD named Samuel Bodman, later Secretary of Energy. And he said, uh, energy was too much money. That's why it never happened. Energy was looked at as the province of big companies. The idea of a small company making its way was kind of preposterous. Um, the third reason um, that, in a way that uh, MIT resonates in the book is in terms of the N MIT Energy Club. Are there any members here? Great. So uh, people ask me when I you know, go through all the challenges and everything of, uh, on energy, uh, why are you optimistic? And I said very simply, because the Energy Club at MIT has 3,400 members, 1,200 members of students, and that means a lot of uh, intellectual horsepower seeking answers. And as I understand, there was no Energy Club up until 2004, so a sign of, uh, of the turn and the sign of the commitment, and I'm delighted that members are here today. So all of this is part of a larger story I tell in the quest. 
Uh, it's an unfolding story like any story. It has lots of twists and turns and surprises and uh, many fascinating uh, characters in it. Uh, let me tell you what I was trying to do uh, in it. Uh, Ernie mentioned the prize and I finished the prize it was just a few days actually after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And I wrote then as the kind of final world, words how you know, our, our times have been transformed by the modern and mesmerizing alchemy of petroleum. Ours truly remains the age of oil. Well, that was the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century. And it, you know, it's stunning when you just think how much has changed. Uh, for many people in this room, dominating fact of their lives was the Soviet Union. For some people in this room, they won't remember the Soviet Union. There is no Soviet Union. Uh, it's also interesting to me that China just had a few sentences, really, in the prize. And yet, uh, in the quest, it's the only country that gets two chapters of its own. Climate change, although it was an issue and concern to a limited number of people, it hardly had political traction, uh, very different from today. And uh, shale gas, I guess no one had heard of shale gas, or if it had any name, it was known as uneconomic gas, and there's just never going to be exploited. Prices. 2004, as late as 2004, key oil ministers were saying oil is $20 a barrel, and our great fear is it's going to go, it's going to collapse, and that there's no, there's no floor to it. You know, we, in four years, went from $20 to $147.27, back to $30. And then, of course, what's unfolded this year, uh, Fukushima. If we were meeting on March 10th, we probably would have been talking about the nuclear renaissance. On March uh, 12th, one wasn't. And in terms of the Arab Spring, uh, which is now, some call it the Arab Winter, but the really hard questions now of power and uh, it's gone beyond Twitter and Facebook and Google to who's going to control the government, who's going to control the judiciary and the military and all those things. So. Also, what I wanted to do was uh, cover the whole energy spectrum, the central role of natural gas, challenges of electric power, uh, the question of how climate change went from something that was of interest to a few scientists to being really a dominating political issue. And I found myself uh, going back to the Alps in the 1770s to begin that story, and then renewables and how they all fit in the mix. So what I was trying to do which I guess relates to the work of the Energy in Initiative, is talk about how our energy world's come about, how it's evolving, and where it will go from here. Um, as I said, like any story, it has uh, great characters in it. And I just thought I'd share a couple of them, because uh, I find them so interesting. Some may know, chemists may know, the name Ari Hagen-Smith, uh, a, a chemistry professor at Caltech, um, a great expert. He, deciphered the taste, where the chemistry of the taste of, of onions, garlic, and wine came from. He also identified the active ingredient in marijuana, uh, but that was not his life's work. He was really fascinated uh, by pineapples and understanding the taste of pineapples. He was working on that in his lab at Caltech in 1948 and decided to go outside for a breath of fresh air. He walked outside. Maybe he went out for a smoke, I don't know. But, uh, and instead of this wonderful California sunshine, found himself enveloped what he called that stinking cloud of smog. He said, you know, I'm a chemist. I can solve it. I can figure it out. Because there was a huge argument. Where, what caused smog? Was it caused by the million and a half incinerate, backyard incinerators in Los Angeles? Huge subject of debate. He, he said he figured it out on the first nickel that it came from, of course, out of automobile uh, engines primarily. He then... Uh, Ronald Reagan then signed legislation to create the California Air Resources Board, who became the first chairman, but Ari Hagen-Smith, and then started the process where, uh, to clean up the air, and, and in 1990, uh, the first decision to have uh, zero emission vehicles, which was redone. So you can kind of draw a straight line from 1948 and Ari Hagen-Smith to uh, the electric cars that are appearing on our roads. Um, Another um, figure in the book, geopolitical figure, is Haider Aliyev, who was uh, a Soviet man, a KGB general, party secretary of Azerbaijan, member of the Soviet Politburo, and then he has a tremendous fight uh, with Mikhail Gorbachev, gets thrown out, sent back to Azerbaijan, and uh, is 
career is over, and then the Soviet Union breaks down. He becomes the president of Azerbaijan, and he did more than anybody else to reconnect the Caspian, uh, the resources of Central Asia, to, uh, to the rest of the world. We know today a lot of students are having trouble getting jobs as they're graduating, and this uh, young man was having considerable difficulty. He had a very good degree in science, but he could not get a job. Uh, he took up tutoring, uh, didn't get many customers, offered free samples for his tutoring, didn't get many customers. Uh, his situation was so bad that his father wrote a letter to a chemistry professor and said, uh, my son grows, can you help him find a job? He grows more and more unhappy day by day. Uh, he feels his career has been derailed. That, of course, was Albert Einstein. Uh, and uh, so he did get his job in Bern in the patent office, as uh, you all know, and didn't have much to do, and so wrote five uh, amazing papers in the summer of 1905, one of them on photoelectricity, for which he received the Nobel Prize. And then you realize it took half a century to actually put that in first use, and it was uh, in the space race with the Soviet Union. And here we are today, 106 years later, and still... Uh, the question. In fact, I think it's one of the top research projects for the Energy Initiative to assess uh, where uh, photovoltaics and solar energy goes from here, kind of proving that long lead times uh, in, in the energy field. Um, I'll just mention two other characters and then get to the substance, just because they're both interesting. This is the only book on energy that any of you will ever read in your entire lives that talks about the worst moment in Ronald Reagan's career as an actor and proves its relevance, I should add. Uh, and that came when, uh, after he was head of Screen Actors Guild, he couldn't get work, and the only job he could do was doing stand-up comedy, fronting for a singing group called the Continentals in uh, Las Vegas. Did it for a couple of weeks, hated it, came back to LA, thought his career was over, and uh, then his agent calls and says, Ronnie, and what he has is this deal to go to work for General Electric, as many in this room will remember, became its spokesman. And the reason I write about it is because that was a time when the U.S. really was electrified as a society. Our electricity demand was growing at that point at 10, 11 percent a year, like, a, like China or India's today, and how it transformed lives, and then use that to talk about the kind of impact on the world of the energy de electricity demand growth that we're seeing in uh, China and India and other countries. I should mention, there is a photograph in the book of uh, Ronald Reagan and his wife, uh, Nancy, uh, during that phase of his life, uh, advertising this amazing new product called a portable radio, and uh, it was really considered quite extraordinary. Uh, last person I just want to mention, and one of the things I try to do in this book is ask, where did things come from? How did they come about? And so one of the questions in my mind is, how did the modern wind industry come about? We know about Don Quixote. Wind's been, you know, it's not new. So how did it come about? And I found this man named, some may know him, named Jim Delson, uh, who spent New Year's Eve not having a, going out and partying, not having a good time, but atop a turbine in a blizzard in the Tehachapi Pass in California, trying to get it up by midnight. And the reason he needed to get it up by midnight is because the tax credits expired at midnight. This was not merely an incentive, but it was life or death. So he said, there are, these machines aren't working. There has to be a better way. He ends up in Europe, discovers the... Uh, Danish wind industry, which is based upon sturdy Danish agricultural machinery, and he starts importing them, and California in the 1980s becomes the epicenter of uh, the wind industry based upon these uh, Danish uh, uh, wind machines. So in answer to the question, where did the modern wind industry come from, I would at least make the argument uh, that it's the result of the marriage of the sturdy Danish agricultural machinery industry and California tax credits, and thus uh, we're there. By the way, Delson's company then gets bought by Enron, then gets bought by General Electric, and now the largest supplier of wind turbines uh, in the United States. Well, those are kind of some of the way that tell the story, but there are really three big questions that run through the narrative and really, be, and, the, and I kept encountering, and that's because I think they're really the three big questions about energy. The first one is about um, uh, growth uh, and scarcity. If we have today a $65 trillion world economy, two, two and a half decades, uh, the current malaise will end and recovery will begin, we'll have maybe a non $65 trillion world economy, but a $130 trillion world economy. Question is, 
where does the energy come from? What's the mix of the energy and who provides it? So that's the first big question. Second is uh, the questions of uh, security, the classic questions of security that uh, go, uh, you know, have been really perennial, really since, his, since Churchill converted the Royal Navy from coal to uh, oil and went from being dependent upon Welsh coal to Persian uh, oil, and uh, most recently Libya, the disruption there. And then it's the question of the new threats, and in particular the new threats in terms of uh, cyber vulnerability. What the CEO of Sony has called the bad new world of uh, cyber vulnerability after uh, their website was attacked and cost them $170 million to deal with it. And then the third one is, of course, energy and environment. How do you achieve energy objectives and achieve environmental objectives at the same time? How do you find a balance? How do you put them all together? So those are the kind of questions that I would like to talk about today. Um, the, um, there are certain features that are constant to energy, uh, and one is geopolitics. Um, and of course, much of the focus uh, is on uh, the Middle East, where 60% of reserves are. And there's a very interesting graphic in the book that just shows the distribution of population in the developed worlds and the developing worlds, and in particular in the Middle East. And what you see is, of course, a very different demographic uh, uh, distribution, huge youth bulge. Uh, and that youth bulge was kind of one of the main things that drove what became known as the Arab Spring that overturned uh, the order that had been in place for really for decades there. And uh, with that has come uh, higher expectations, but now you know, the reality is there. Egypt was growing at 5% before uh, the Arab Spring. Now it's negative growth. Uh, there's not going to, you know, in, there's not going to be investment, uh, much less tourism. And so all of that creates this uh, question of what happens when expectations are not met. And of course, as I said, the battle for power. Uh, second uh, in the Middle East is the continuing question of al-Qaeda and extremism. And there I just say there are many things to look at, but pay particular attention to Yemen, a failed state uh, in a crucial location with an 1,100-mile border with Saudi Arabia. And then the third one is Iran and the question of what is there going to be the relationship uh, there. And I think with the UN report of about three weeks ago, we uh, in, entered into a new uh, higher range of, uh, of, of tension. And uh, at the very least, uh, there's going to be, or already has begun, an arms race in the region. Uh, it's not clear that there's any equilibrium or what the outcome is going to be. And I think this is going to be just a general cloud uh, over energy. The expectation now in the oil markets is that uh, this coming year, the supply picture will be better, prices will be different. But as we saw yesterday, it took uh, just some, really some statements for Tehran for prices to go up $4 and uh, the sense of, of tension. The other big geopolitical question that is uh, there, and it's sort of farther out, is uh, with China. And one encounters again and again people who say there's an inevitable conflict between the United States and China uh, over uh, oil. And you hear it in those words that are used uh, like hegemon and domination and so forth, and a particular focus on the South China Sea. And um, you can see how this could indeed uh, unfold. And sometimes as I listen to these debates, I hear uh, echoes of the Anglo-German naval race before uh, the First World War. But I think this is a topic that, uh, and a subject that takes great effort by both countries. Uh, to focus on the common interest as consumers, access, investment, uh, and stability, and indeed the integration of the two economies, and to focus on the commercial uh, rather than the strategic. And I think it's going to be hard, and we'll see this kind of rise up. And certainly in the last year, uh, there's been a rise of tension uh, over the South China Sea. Um, a second uh, major theme that I want to talk about that uh, deals with the questions uh, is what I call the globalization demand. You know, I, I think we all know it, but it's still useful to just look at some of the numbers that show what the changes are. In 2000, the ratio of oil used in the developed world to the developing world was two to one. 
Now it's one-to-one, -one, and of course it's going to change and go in the other direction. But I find actually the most vivid way to kind of see the challenge is to, uh, to look at it in terms of um, automobiles. 2,000, U.S., 17 million new cars sold. China, less than 2 million. Last year, 17 million cars in China, uh, 11 million in the United States. And that is continuing to shift. And that, you know, in that you really see uh, where the demand is, uh, is changing. Uh, the phrase I use, uh, I don't know if some of you have done this, when, you know, if you move into an office building, you have a thing called the build out where the landlord says, you know, I'll, I'll put these offices there and that there. And I think we have an example of a whole country that's going through the build out, which is China, which is the 20 million people a year moving from countryside to cities. They need housing, they need transport, they need jobs. All of that is uh, very energy intensive. And so the change, and I think it was really only 2004 where it became clear, is the growth of emerging markets. There's a tendency to say that it's without precedent to, to have this kind of growth. Actually, there is a precedent. And it was a precedent at the end of the 1960s and the beginning of the 1970s when you suddenly had this huge growth in oil demand because of the economic miracles in Europe and Japan, because countries were switching from coal to oil, and the market was getting very, very tight. It was getting as tight as it was in 2005. And then that intersected uh, with the uh, Yom Kippur War and the crisis that ensued and the oil crisis decade. So, you know, when you do look at these uh, numbers going up, and how they're going to be met, you have to you know, ask that question, uh, what, how do you meet this challenge of growth and what will be the mix? Let me say um, a few words about technology. Uh, talking about renewables, I really talk about, I use the phrase, uh, the rebirth of renewables. Because in the 1970s and 1980s, there was this huge enthusiasm. I mean, there were 5,000 people going to renewable energy conferences in Washington in 1976. Now, they called it solar energy at that time, not renewable energy. And this kind of drive was, it came from Earth Day, uh, oil crises, energy security price. Indeed, um, it was in the 1970s that, uh, in part, uh, the development of the lithium battery began in an Exxon laboratory uh, because uh, Exxon, uh, you know, like everybody else, uh, we were on the oil mountain. The age of oil was over, and so that's uh, tech, how to look at these other technologies. Then the renewable industry went through something that became known as the Valley of Death. As people struggled to hold on, uh, as oil prices came down, incentives went away, it lost its, uh, its, uh, its drive. Then um, around the beginning of this century, it, it really was a rebirth. And two things uh, have really driven it. One is uh, climate as a consideration, much greater emphasis. I think that's probably the most important reason. And the second is growth and the growth of demand. How are you going to uh, meet it? And I kind of look at it, I almost see it like a relay race. That it was a, bat a baton that the U.S. held. It passed to Japan. Japan kept it during the Valley of Death, passed it to Germany, which brought it, had its, uh, its uh, feed-in tariffs, uh, and then uh, and the Greens were in the government. Then it came back to the U.S., and now great debate as to whether it's going to be passed uh, to China. Um, and obviously everybody's involved, but where the leadership will be and where the, where the growth and support will be. I was very struck in talking to one of the Chinese decision makers about the kind of shift in emphasis. And he was talking about the fierce winds in the northwest of China. And he said, we used to regard them as a natural disaster. Now we regard them as a precious resource. And that kind of captured for me the change. So renewables today, in contrast to in the past, are a big business. Last year, uh, uh, $120 billion was uh, invested in renewable generation around the world, about a third of the total. Uh, that's a lot of money, but it's still kind of a small business. Uh, it's a big business and a small business at the same time when you look at the overall scale of the, uh, of, of the energy business. And I'm looking forward very much to what the energy initiative does on solar energy in terms of kind of clarifying the timing and uh, scale and uh, competitiveness. I think it's going to be a harder period ahead, actually, because of uh, that term uh, that is used 
uh, fiscal consolidation, i.e., meaning governments don't have the money that they used to have, and you see the cutbacks in support. Uh, in Britain, they've cut back on, on solar and, and others. And so I think it's just, it's, this is, there's been an up period. I think there'll be a, a down period here. But what's been the biggest innovation in energy in the last um, two or three decades? John Deutsch said it. He said in his Foreign Affairs article a few months ago, uh, the greatest shift in energy reserve estimates in the last half century, and talking about shale gas. And you look at it in terms of its scale, and you say yes. And it is. It's a very interesting innovation story. Uh, innovation is an interesting subject. Many of you are deeply interested in it. And uh, am I not talking loud enough? Or can you hear okay? Uh, uh, and what are the sources of innovation, and what drives them, and so forth? And sometimes it's large enterprises that do it, uh, laboratories do it, but uh, often, you know, it's one person who drives things. And in the case of shale gas, it was one person, it was a man named George P. Mitchell. Uh, not their Senator George Mitchell, but uh, uh, not an oil man, a gas man from Houston who uh, read an academic article by a geologist in the early 1980s and became convinced that it was possible to get shale uh, gas out of shale rock, which people just didn't think was possible. Fifteen years he pushed his company. The guys working for him said, George, you're wasting your money. You're crazy. You're not going to get anywhere. And he said, I respect your opinions, and if, uh, uh, if you don't want to continue, we can find other people who will continue. So they continued. And the first breakthrough came at the end of the 1990s. It's a very interesting story in innovation. But then there was a second one that had to happen, which is when his company was acquired by another company called Devon, which had this other technology. That was hydraulic fracturing, getting it right for shale rock. But then the question was how to drill, and the second was uh, horizontal drilling. And those two things came together in 2003. No one, almost no one noticed except some independent uh, companies, and they went and developed it. The large oil and gas companies were focused on something else. They were focused on liquefied natural gas, spending billions of dollars, billions of dollars uh, building up LNG. We were going to become totally integrated into a global gas market and, uh, and pay global rates. It was only in 2008 that people just looked at the numbers. You've got to look at the numbers. And you looked at the numbers, and you saw that uh, U.S. gas supply, which is supposed to be going down, was going up. And that's when the major companies turned around, uh, pivoted, really, and started investing billions of dollars here in the development of shale gas in the United States. The growth has been phenomenal, from 2% of our supply in 2000 to 34% today. I listened to the debates, and you know, John chaired our committee and everything, and people saying, should we do shale gas or should we not do shale gas? The truth is it's 34% of our production now and continuing to go up. Uh, President Obama, when he assigned us to uh, do our study, talked about 100 years of supply. Uh, obviously, this debate has uh, developed over the environmental issues. And um, I think one of the things, John, that we concluded in, in our committee is when people use this term fracking, first of all, most people had not heard of fracking two years ago. Now everybody talks about fracking as though, uh, at least in Congress, as though they've been talking about it all their life, hydraulic fracturing. But uh, I think one of our colleagues pointed out it's really a bumper sticker for the whole process of developing uh, shale gas. Uh, and uh, from beginning the drilling through uh, the concluding of it. And in um, you know, the work, and I don't want to repeat what John said yesterday because you did a whole seminar on this, but uh, I think it became apparent that the main issues is were what do you do with the water that comes out uh, as a result out of the wells afterwards? What about air quality, which, because you have all these diesel engines, and what about the community impact about having all of these trucks going through people's communities? And those are real issues that have to be addressed. Um, and the last one was very interesting. I did a thing on Capitol Hill a couple of weeks ago with a group of congressmen, and there was a Democratic congressman from Western Pennsylvania there who said, um, he said, you know, one of the things that really bothers my constituents is they see all these trucks appearing, and they have license plates from Oklahoma and Texas, and it just makes them uneasy. And I thought, um, you know, that's this kind of community impact. Who, who are these people? And I think we came out with 20 pragmatic uh, suggestions to address it in order that this resource can be uh, developed and uh, to try and kind of detoxify the, the debate which had gotten to be, we thought, very emotional. Uh, the impact of shale gas 
goes across the entire energy spectrum. It's changed the cost structure. It's changed the economics because now you have a low cost, probably at so low cost now that it can't be sustained, a relatively low carbon fuel source. It's become, it's the default, uh, the default for electric power. And uh, even uh, uh, we had a conference earlier this year, and John Rowe, who's the CEO of Exelon, which has the largest nuclear fleet in the country, uh, he said, you know, don't bet against cheap natural gas, that there's this kind of movement uh, for it. I think, uh, and it's just got its pressure. It creates new competitive pressures for renewable. It creates new competitive pressures for coal. So uh, it's, at least in North America, very significant indeed. Uh, the impact, economic impact, is something that is not so easily looked at, but it looks like it basically saves us about $100 billion a year that we would be spending on importing liquefied natural gas. And uh, last week, our sister company came out with a study on the job impact, and I think we were all quite impressed. When we were doing our report, we didn't really know. We saw a number of studies that suggested it could be a couple hundred thousand jobs. Uh, this latest analysis suggests it's over 600,000 jobs. It's very hard to think of any other industries in the United States in the last few years that have created 600,000 jobs, so it's uh, quite significant. Where else is it going to be? Well, we know it's not going to be in France because they saw the movie Gasland and decided uh, that they would not uh, allow it. Uh, England, uh, maybe. Uh, Germany, probably not. Eastern Europe, very interested in it. China, intensely interested in it. Uh, and Latin America, interested in it. Uh, so, but one of the other things it's done is it's also opened up a, another technological horizon, and that brings me to the subject of what to expect since oil. We have a tight market in oil today, and in fact, in terms of uh, the average annual oil price, at least as of uh, today, uh, is higher than it has been at any time uh, since 1860. Uh, which is a year after the foundation of the oil industry. Very interesting. I mean, it's there because we have tight markets, because we have uh, the emerging market uh, growth, and because we have the geopolitical tension uh, in the market. Um, now, of course, those may not have followed it today. Oil, uh, like most other markets, crashed today. So uh, we did this calculation. We have 235 days of trading data, and we have 12 days to go. So we'll see if it still remains to the highest average price since 1860, uh, 12, days, uh, 12 market days from now. But what we're seeing is a kind of rebalancing of world oil. And again, it's about technology. Two technology breakthroughs and one continuing advance in technology. So let me take the, the advance in technology, uh, and that's Canadian oil sands. It was, um, it was only, uh, it was as long ago as in 1925 that a, a, a chemist at the University of Alberta demonstrated that you could get bitumen out of this sand and clay and get it to flow, but only in a laboratory. Decades and decades followed, and it was regarded oil sands as a fringe technology until the late 1990s. Then two things. One was technology advances, and the other was a change in the fiscal regime. And today, uh, Canadian oil sands is at one and a half million barrels a day. Now you say, well, how much is that? Well, that's more than Libya was exporting before the Civil War. So it's quite a significant uh, number. Uh, that capacity, uh, that production capacity could go to three million barrels a day. But we see the controversy over it, and it was very evident with the president postponing the decision on the Keystone XL, which would bring about 700,000 barrels a day of uh, oil sands down to, uh, to in, into the United States, down to the Gulf Coast. And of course, it, it was really not an argument about the pipeline. It was an argument about oil sands and about its carbon footprint, and it's very controversial. I just say that kind of the analysis that we've done is, and we've looked at a lot of other studies, that the carbon footprint is about 6% higher from a well-to-wheels basis than, uh, than the average barrel of oil that we use in the United States. And we use a lot of other barrels of oil that are, have the same carbon footprint uh, and some that are even higher, that obviously most of the carbon is produced out of the auto engine. So there are different ways to look at it. Some look at it uh, from an environmental point of view. Uh, I look at it also just saying this is a very large resource and it's in our neighbor. And by the way, if it, we don't uh, 
take all of it, uh, they're going to sell it to China. And indeed, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, Harper, Stephen Harper, basically said that. He said, you know, we can't really depend anymore just on one market. We need a second market, and that market has to be in Asia. Uh, the second uh, development uh, that's so interesting is what's happening off the coast of Brazil has a new degree of controversy now after uh, sh uh, a very small leak by one uh, uh, U.S. oil company working there. But this is the pre-salt. And this too, this was not really recognized. The breakthrough was until 2005. Uh, it gives Brazil the category, ca capacity to become a superpower of energy. Uh, the estimates are, given their current production and that, they could be producing 5 million barrels a day of oil by 2020. Again, what's the scale of that? That's twice what Venezuela produces today. Very significant for Brazil. Uh, very caught up in Brazilian politics. Uh, very, uh, it's been described as seen as a solution to all of Brazil's problems. So big program to develop. It's like creating a second North Sea. Uh, will it go as smoothly? You know, we'll see, but it's, but it's a huge scale. Uh, the third is, uh, and maybe the new, new thing, is tight oil. And I would say that it's really been on the radar less than two, two years. And this uses the same technology as uh, shale gas, except for oil. And it was basically people saying, hey, it, this works for gas, let's try it for oil. And again, just the, the volumes are very large. It's gone from being very small to about a million barrels a day, and it's thought could be three million barrels a day uh, by the uh, end of this, uh, uh, this decade. So altogether, this means much larger production in the Western Hemisphere. And that means, uh, as I said, a rebalancing in, in the Western Hemisphere and in world oil. It means we have in the United States probably peak demand our oil demand is not going to go up. It's going to be flat and decline because we're going to drive a lot more efficient automobiles and because of demographics. Uh, at the same time, it means less east-west oil trade and more of a north-south oil tra uh, trade. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be energy independent, which is this dream that we've heard from every president since Richard Nixon. We're going to still be part of a global market, but it's going to be more resilient and uh, with greater energy security. A number of interesting questions uh, come out of that, one of which is, uh, what does that mean for the security of the Gulf, the Persian Gulf? The U.S. basically took on that responsibility in 1971 when the British pulled out, but if more of that oil, more and more is going east and not uh, west, uh, what's the role of other countries, specifically China uh, and India? And it's interesting to see the Chinese are now part of the anti-piracy uh, uh, forces off the coast of Somalia and so forth and kind of collaboration. Let me just mention two other important themes. One is um, energy efficiency. And by the way, when I mentioned our Harvard Business School study that got on the front page of the New York Times, it was because it, it emphasized energy efficiency. And I think kind of everybody recognizes that this is really the huge energy resource. The U.S. is twice as energy efficient as it was a few decades ago. Uh, isn't this the thing that meets energy goals, meets environmental goals, big impact? But, uh, and there's so much, and I know there's a lot of work uh, that's done here on that. But there is a problem with it. And the problem is that it was sum uh, summarized for me by the uh, then energy commissioner of the European Union. He said the problem, he said energy efficiency, we can accomplish so much with it. He said the problem is there's no red ribbon to cut. There's no photo opportunity for politicians and business leaders and engineers and all to do things. And I thought, you know, he's right. And then about four weeks ago, I realized he's wrong and I'm wrong. And that was when this 787, uh, the Dreamliner made its, Boeing Dreamliner made its first flight from uh, Tokyo to Hong Kong. And there is a plane that is 20% more energy efficient. And there's a 250-ton uh, red ribbon, uh, an example of what can be done. And it's a very interesting story because the um, Boeing was trying to decide whether to build a plane that went 20% faster, which probably a lot of people in this room would like, or one that would go 20%, be 20% more efficient, which the customers wanted, which is the airline. So they invited everybody out there, 59 airlines, and said, hey, let's have a vote. It was like an uh, uh, a Iowa caucus. And uh, you, you had to walk to one side of the room or the other. And so 
There are 59 airlines there. Zero walked to 20% faster. 59, 59 of them walked to 20% more energy efficient. And of course, there it's because the costs were so significant, and it took Boeing a few years longer than they thought, but it is uh, a demonstration. Um, let me end on the subject of the electric car that I know that some uh, here are extremely uh, interested in. Um, and that's really the question of what kind of car will people be driving in the future? Uh, will it be a much more efficient car? Will it be a hybrid? Will it be natural gas vehicles, plug-in electrics? Again, something that uh, the Energy Initiative is addressing both from an overview as well as the research that's doing here. But what strikes me is um, how the chasm of a century gets closed. There's a picture in the book of uh, Thomas Edison, who was at the time the most famous American in the entire world, having dinner with a young engineer from the Detroit uh, Edison Company uh, by the name of Henry Ford. And Edison, hard of hearing, was like that in the picture. And Ford was explaining to him what he wanted to do. And Edison said, you know, sounds like a very good idea. I think you should do it. And he said, I like that fuel you're going to use, that hydrocarbon. Well. Uh, Ford said that that really gave him the confidence to go out and do it and to uh, actually quit Detroit Edison and uh, launch himself on this. Uh, on the other side, though, Edison changed his mind. He didn't like the uh, air pollution that came out of it. Uh, he didn't like having to crank and so forth. And he said, I've solved all these problems. I can solve this one, too. And uh, he promised a utility, a famous utility executive, Samuel Insull, that he would give him a lot more customers. Uh, and he spent a lot of money and time on it. And there were these Edisons that were scurrying around. But then, of course, Ford came out with the Model T, $825, turned it into a mass market vehicle. And uh, the electric car kind of was um, uh, on, you know, up on blocks. Uh, it faded away. It was a lady's car or the doctor's car. Um, then, uh, you know, if we went back five or six years ago, it was about biofuels. Uh, that was what all the excitement was about. And there's a quote in the book from George W. Bush uh, explaining why he was uh, so keen as a Texas former oil man uh, on biofuels and ethanol. He said because he wanted to get Hugo Chavez and Ahmadinejad, as he put it, out of the Oval Office. But then, you know, 2008 or so is when we see the real fascination with the electric car again. Uh, to meet many of the needs, including uh, uh, the question of growth in a uh, developing world. But there is the uh, striking um, two pictures that are really striking the book that are, you got to look at them together. One is a picture of a woman charging uh, an electric car uh, in 1910. And then there's another picture right under it of the CEO of Nissan uh, charging uh, a leaf. Uh, in 2010, and if you look at the picture, it actually looks like exactly the same picture. It just tells you that uh, uh, it is like this reconnection. Uh, the view that I think we take is it'll probably be five or ten years before we really know uh, where electric vehicles, uh, what kind of traction they have as niche vehicles or as mass market vehicles. Well, kind of to tie this all together, uh, what to expect? what to expect. And I always have to say, based upon what we know today, because there will be surprises that will take us in other directions, but it does appear that in a couple decades from now, world energy demand will be about 30 or 35 percent higher than it is today. It does appear that renewables and alternatives will grow a lot, but so will conventional. So this kind of surprising thing is uh, that the energy mix may not be too different although gas may have a much larger l role. Now, that's based upon what we know today. But I'm so conscious that this is a story with many surprises, what we don't know. Uh, no one saw, sh very few people saw uh, shale gas coming. I wonder what's happening on the MIT Energy Campus, uh, what faculty and researchers are working on, uh, what members of the uh, MIT Energy Club are up to. And uh, I think that we could perhaps see some significant uh, some significant surprises. Uh, those who've written books may know, at least I don't know if it's true for all of you. I should ask some of you if you agree. I find the hardest thing is to write the conclusion because you spend all this time, five, six years working in a book, and you have to finally say, you have to figure out for yourself what it's about, and you have to figure out uh, for your readers what you want to leave them with. And so I think the quest when you read it, you'll find that it actually ends on an optimistic note and in a kind of surprising way. And it goes back to uh, a young man named Sadi Carnot, 
Carnot's cycle, you all know it. But it's interesting, in addition to being a scientist and engineer, and he published his, he wanted to understand the steam engine, he published his paper in 1824, the, I think it was called the motive power force of, of fire. Uh, uh, and, but it was interesting because he's not only a scientist, but he was also a, a, a soldier. His father had actually been uh, Napoleon's minister of war. And he was convinced that the British had defeated the French partly because of their mastery of energy, the steam engine. And uh, he wanted to get the French up uh, as a patriot to, to be even. But he had a phrase that he uh, used which really struck in my mind, stuck in my mind, which he said, he described it, what had happened with the steam engine as a great revolution in human civilization. For the first time, it wasn't animal, uh, mostly animal and human labor. That was this huge change and a, a great revolution in, 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 in civilization. And so that's the way I th really think about this whole sweep as you look about it. It's a great revolution. It's about technology, some of them that come sort of expected and some of them that come as very big surprises and again and again uh, kind of rewriting the face of energy. And so as far, you know, the reason that I'm optimistic is because I think that the, uh, this great revolution, there's no reason that it's over. Some people, there's this tendency to think technology is over, but you all know that it's not over. And so uh, that's why I'm quite convinced uh, that the quest that I write about and that many of you are part of, a quest for uh, secure, environmentally sound, uh, reasonably priced energy will continue and really must continue to meet these considerable challenges that await us in the future. Thanks. Dan? Okay. Oh, you know, More to we're, come. Not, we're not finished. Uh, so, uh, we're not done yet. Dan now, has now we turn uh, the table. suggested that we uh, turn the usual tables where I ask him some questions. Uh, first, and then we'll open it up for Q and A to the uh, to the audience. Um, first uh, question, Dan, I'd like to ask is: In fact, today you gave a whole bunch of reasons for tight, we had tight oil markets, geopolitical uncertainty. You also noted something I didn't know that there was a mi mini crash today. Yeah. Why did we only talk about oil? Hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred dollars. Why aren't we talking about again thirty dollar oil? And if we were to have a drop in oil prices, what would be the consequences? Right. Um, I think that, um, I think I see about this today that oil is, there's, is the only financial, is, it, is the microphone on? Yeah. 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 Uh, is the only financial asset that on any given day gives you both the temperature of uh, the world economy and the temperature of geopolitics. And so yesterday it went up on, uh, uh, statements from Tehran about the Strait of Hormuz. Today it's down on the, on the, on the global economy. Uh, I think that, you know, I can give you a number of reasons that have to do with um, a higher cost structure, uh, that at some point uh, the producers then cut back, that if it does come down, it doesn't stay down very long, unless we have a massive economic uh, catastrophe. I mean, we do have one scenario uh, that we work with, this vortex scenario, you know, the 1998 Oil prices collapsed. You had an emerging market crisis. Uh, oil prices went down when we had a developed market crisis, i.e., in the U.S. in 2008. What would happen if both happened at the same time? And China slowing down. Yeah, then you could have that. You would have a lot of consequences, including a great deal of instability uh, in countries that are highly dependent upon those revenues and have become even more dependent with the passage of time. Mm -hmm. Let me ask uh, one other. Uh, question going back to your comment earlier, you quoted, you made, a, you offered a quote, uh, energy is for big companies. And in the end, the question is going to be, is, in fact, may, is that actually in fact true, despite your comment about all the entrepreneurial activity? So, for example. I feel like asking you that question. You, uh, <laughs> well, I'm asking the question. Okay. Uh, you, uh, you noted that, for example, uh, in effect, the biggest consequential new technology development was the, the fracking and horizontal drilling. And indeed, we have seen a scaling there that's remarkable. As you said, 35% from nothing. Uh, but that's a technology that fed into an energy incumbent industry. 
we hadn't seen that yet with the new technologies. Right. What do you think? Well, that's why, um, you know, I call this uh, chapter the science experiment, and that's a term for those who don't know. It's a term of art uh, that is used by venture capitalists, and it describes what they don't want to invest in. They don't want to invest in science experiments. They want to invest in things that are going to be commercial, that you can scale. And uh, 2004, in so many ways, was a turning point when you look at energy now. And that's kind of when Silicon Valley and venture capitalists discovered energy and said, look what we did in IT, look what we've done in biotech. Uh, uh, we, we can do the same thing in uh, energy. Uh, we'll disintermediate the big companies. I think the general lesson that they take away is that energy is harder, it's more capital intensive, you have to raise more money, more times, takes longer, a lot of government regulation. Uh, and you know, a view is uh, you have to be much more judicious uh, or put an awful lot of bets down. So I think it's just, it's just taking, taking longer uh, to do that. I mean, that quote was from Sam Bodman describing himself as a, as a young man, why they weren't investing in energy. Your Silicon Valley quote sounds a little bit like, if you're losing money, make it up in volume. Right, yeah. Right, I see. Uh, yeah. But I, I think, and I don't know if maybe we'll hear from if there are any VCs in the room, but uh, I think that's, that's been the general uh, appreciation. And you've seen kind of a shift, uh, a shift back in focus in some of the major firms. Nevertheless, I think it's a different deal to have you know, this other engine of innovation called venture capital engaged in it. Uh, it's, it, there are new players, and you know, over time, I think there will be an impact. Mm -hmm. Last question I'll, I will ask is, you mentioned uh, Fukushima. Uh, what's your view of nuclear power going forward? Uh, patchwork. Uh, I think um, you know, some countries, China seems determined to go ahead. Uh, other developing, you know, India and others will go ahead. Uh, I think that, uh, obviously, the most dramatic turnaround was uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany going from being an advocate of nuclear power to saying we're going to shut it down by 2022. Uh, even it's now become for the first time uh, an issue in the French presidential election. Uh, so I think the reverberations of Fukushima continue. And I think as the problems and the difficulties of fully bringing that to an end, I think that continues to wear on it. I think, I think in the United States, we continue to go ahead with, you know, or companies go ahead with a couple of projects, uh, but it's um, a much more difficult path. Russia will go ahead. Mm -hmm. Great, we're gonna open it up to questions. Uh, we'd like uh, questioners to be able to access the microphones, which you can either come to or have them carried to you. Um, there's a question up in the back. Oh, two questions here. Uh, Michael, though, you, you were offered. Would you like the first question? Sure. <laughs> Thanks for your talk, Dan. Uh, I got to read the prize and uh, really enjoyed and learned a lot from learning about the dynamics within the Middle East, um, kind of the, a lot of the Saudi versus Iranian issues. Um, so as you watched the Arab Spring unfold, what were the kind of the key uh, relationships and dynamics that you watched that maybe without that perspective others wouldn't have watched or looked for? Um, that's a, that's a good question. Well, one thing is indeed watching uh, the continuing Saudi-Iranian uh, uh, competition, which is reflected in, in, in Syria, reflected in Bahrain, reflected in, in Yemen. I think that's a very important uh, determination. Um, you know, so looking kind of to the, the impact on, on, the, on the, the Gulf side of it, um, and I think it was a sense that, uh, that the you know, exaltation was going to come up against the hard reality of who was going to govern these countries and, and how was it going to be put together. And that the economic recovery from it, uh, rebound, was going to be more difficult. And that that would also have revenue implications for the oil exporting countries in terms of uh, what they were going to, more money spent at home or in the region. So I think those were some of them. Okay, let's, go, let's go to this side. Thanks. I came here with a question which I forgot about it. I was listening th critically to so much of what you were saying. Got distracted. Then I was reminded of it when I heard you tell the story about Edison saying, um, you know, um, 
the story about with the conversation with Ford, and the word that jumped in my mind was externalities. So that reminded me of the question, which is, what should be, if, is there such a thing as a true price for carbon? Should there be, I mean, it would seem to me that this would change a lot of what you're talking about, a lot. Uh, what, should there be a, a price for carbon? I mean, a real price for it, and what should it be? And how should we get there? Well, I don't know how we get there. I think it's, uh, at least in the United States, it's very difficult to see how you get there. You tend to get shadow prices for carbon, for instance, uh, renewable portfolio standards uh, by states requiring, as California does, a third of their electric generation to be renewable is, in effect, a, a kind of trying to find a shadow price because you do have a higher price as a result of that. What should the price of carbon be? Um, I don't know. I think that's a topic for the energy initiative. To I, it should, should be high enough to reduce carbon emissions yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in a non-trivial way. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. uh, this side, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there, okay. So given that we're obviously going to have an abundance of hydrocarbons, uh, do you think that CCS becomes a more practical way of dealing with carbon emissions? Well, again, I feel... Uh, uh, CCS, carbon capture and sequestration. Sorry, yeah, sorry. G given the work of the uh, Energy Initiative on that and, uh, and what John Deutsch has done, uh, I take away that if 60% um, if CO2 was captured and turned into a liquid, that would be the same volume as our current oil consumption. Uh, that seems, in, in, in effect, you'd be like creating, uh, it, we talk about big oil, we'd be talking about a new industry called big carbon, and you'd have to have this industry to go in reverse. And it seems to me that it, uh, at this stage, at least from what I know, it's very challenging. And as John has pointed out, we have not had any demonstration projects to really show what can be done. So uh, it seems to me it's still you know, the kind of enthusiasm of a couple of years ago is dissipated as, as people look at how hard it is. And given, let's say, the issues that you see over shale gas, what would be the issues over, um, you know, storing carbon and, uh, and carbon dioxide and who would be uh, the liability and all those things? So, I mean, it's certainly a thing that people are going to continue to work on. But I think like many of these energy challenges, they turn, tend to turn out to be more daunting than they might have first seen. I might just add one uh, uh, postscript to that. Uh, following uh, John's talk yesterday, there was a discussion about the lack of uh, disposal capacity in Pennsylvania. And we got an answer back from a Schlumberger colleague, et cetera, that said that there was an area where it could be done. So disposal wells for the water produced from fracking, except it was being reserved as a possible future CO2 sequestration. Uh, so. Formation, so that's actually I, I had never realized that this kind of a direct competition almost. Right, sir. Yeah, interesting. Please. Yeah, thank you. You said you are uh, very optimistic about the security of supply of energy for the future. No, no, I, I don't think so. <laughs> you didn't think so. I'm sorry if I gave that impression. I got to do my talk again. No. <laughs> sorry, then I missed no, that. But, but so, go ahead. Anyway, uh, anyway, it's a, uh, abundant. I'm, I'm optimistic about the MIT Energy Club. <laughs> Good. So, sorry if I. <laughs> okay. um, anyway, so abun abundant or more or less abundant uh, fossil resources are a reason to be pessimistic about the climate in the future. So are you pessimistic? Are you optimistic about uh, sort of managing the climate problem? And if you're optimistic, so what are the reasons sort well, of beyond e existence you know, of in the energy initiatives? I mean, I wish that I were able to say, that's why I said that third big question, energy objectives and environmental objectives. And I wish one could have a great answer of how they fit together. But it, when you look at the kind of energy trends, you look at the growth in the emerging markets, you see these, uh, the, this growth is there. Uh, and you see them you know, burning coal uh, and saying that you know, economic growth is more important to us than other things. Uh, it, it's not clear at all how these things get balanced. I do see more supply as being going back to your security question, uh, it does add to actually, it does improve the security outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that notion a couple of years ago, uh, you know, peak oil and that the world was going to run out of oil was a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that uh, actually could lead, 
promote conflict in, 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 in one way or another. And uh, I think uh, it also helped in itself to drive up prices. So I think resilience of supply helps address the security of supply question. Uh, using more natural gas and less coal partly addresses that. And I think the notion that natural gas can, you know, the famous bridge fuel uh, is, is a way to do that. But I think this big question of um, how you meet these objectives, it is to me the great question and it's not like there's a really clear answer uh, to it at this stage, except what is the answer is gonna be technology in ways that maybe we don't know. One word, are you optimistic or pessimistic? About uh, the climate. climate change? I think it's uh, harder to deal with, uh, uh, well, I think it's, as we've seen at Durban, it's harder to deal with from a policy point of view. It really has to be dealt with ultimately from a technology point of view. Uh, uh, Bobby Valentine here has a question. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jurgen, um, as an Energy Club member, and uh, I also write a thing called the DOD Energy Blog. This question for you, I'm not sure I'm going to like the answer. Uh oh. Here we go. So, uh, as somebody who uh, advises not just the largest energy companies, but, but large countries in the world, if somebody asks you, well, given all these latest developments, how much would you recommend, and, and we're thinking of investing, how much should we invest ratio wise in the continued development of? Uh, of traditional or so I'll just say fossil fuels to capture the new ways of getting at them versus clean tech, renewables, things like that? Well, I think, uh, I think given that 80% of our energy is still uh, uh, oil, natural gas, and coal, and there are these security issues, uh, that some investment in that uh, would be a good idea. I think uh, the, our committee that John chaired said that one very useful area of investment would be in, uh, in addressing environmental questions about shale gas that are not being funded by the private sector because they're out of its specter. That is sort of environmental investing R&D and also uh, at the same time it's also uh, in the energy area. Um, obviously most of the efforts going into new technologies I'll tell you, I headed an energy R&D task force for the Department of Energy in the 1990s, and I think the kind of really dis disconcerting thing was how volatile uh, funding is, and that it goes up and down, and it you know, sometimes seems to correlate with the price of oil or the price of gasoline. And as everybody in this room knows, that's not the way to run a research program. And it shouldn't, you know, people should know that they can make careers in this, and there are reasonable funding over a long period of time. And, uh, you know, I hate, I mean, it seems that's the sort of most fundamental investment in the future, and it can cover the whole spectrum, but, the, but it's very deleterious to have this uh, volatility and lack of commitment. So we're going to need to bring this to a close. So what I'm going to ask is these two gentlemen and this gentleman state very brief questions, all of them, then, Dan, you respond to whichever ones you wish. Okay. <laughs> Please. Very short questions. What a great. <laughs> yeah, so this is connected with the last one. So during 2010, the International Energy Agency said on the World Energy Outlook that worldwide fossil fuel subsidies amounted to $409 billion compared to $66 billion for renewable energy. And yet the G20 since 2009 is making calls to phase out fossil fuels around the world. So how do you see that dynamic move forward? Thank you. Okay. The question is um, gas prices relative to oil prices. With the abundance of shale, gas prices are at historic lows relative to oil. Do you see that continuing or because of tight oil and um, um, you know, oil sands and so forth, um, will, will they converge? Sure. Convergence of oil and gas. Okay. All right, there's another interesting photo in the book of uh, Woodrow Wilson walking to church on Gasless Sunday. And under it, he said he gets, uh, ruefully, I'll have to get used to walking to uh, church every Sunday. Unfortunately, that never happened, but it probably would have been a good idea. Instead of just uh, posing the question, is uh, elect uh, electrics, which have their own uh, environmental problems against uh, hydrocarbons, uh, Edison versus Ford, shouldn't we be looking at uh, questioning the basic premises of the uh, car, car culture itself? Uh, does everyone need to have a private automobile? It's probably the most irrational form of transportation ever invented. It's, it should be more like uh, Ford slash uh, Edison versus Thoreau, shouldn't it? Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
Dan, you have three questions. Okay. okay uh, quick. Whatever well, fossil fuel yeah. subsidies, um, that's a very important, where's the person who asked the question? A very important question. There's a mixture of two kinds. Uh, there's the subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, and then there's the subsidies that take the form of uh, price controls. And many of those subsidies in their totals are countries like India or you know, other countries saying, for social peace, we're not, going to, we're not going to charge the full cost of the energy. And they don't want to take the risk. I asked a senior energy guy in China, uh, why don't you just decontrol prices? He said, well, we worry about uh, farmers, soldiers, and taxi cab drivers. I understood farmers and soldiers. I didn't get taxi cab drivers. He's talking about urban unrest over prices. So, you know, so I think you have to look at the subsidies. The other thing I just want to say about subsidies, I read this report about the sh share of U.S. Uh, the subsidies to the U.S. oil and gas industry. And I was very interested to see that the largest single one, over half, was the foreign tax credit. And I was more interested to see that the only footnote in that whole section was my book, The Prize. And the thing that was interesting to me is that The Prize took the opposite point of view, saying that, you know, there is a difference between a royalty and a, I don't want to bore everybody here, and a, and a, and a tax credit, uh, and that it would put American companies at disadvantage. So I think there's some question, you know, how those subsidies of one kind or another uh, are calculated. But I think when Spain is deciding that it's not going to subsidize solar, they're not thinking about subsidies to, you know, to people using uh, diesel fuel in India. So it's kind of hard to have apples and oranges. But I think we're just, you know, the best thing for renewable energy, the best thing for addressing the environment, the best thing for addressing climate is uh, strong economic growth and healthy economies as opposed to, you know, what we seem to be faced with uh, today. And that's why, but I think it's, it's, I think it's cyclical. And that's why I do think the renewable industry today is not, I mean, this is, you know, this is a significant business that will kind of go through this period. And there's still things there, like the renewable portfolio standards that will continue to drive, you know, that. There, there were two more questions, but yeah. you have to give now equally concise answers to the questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. So gas prices. Uh, uh, normally it's 1 to 6 ratio. Now it's 1 to 22. And, uh, I think that uh, I think these gas prices are not sustainable uh, and that uh, they'll play out. Um, Will gas go up or oil come down? <laughs> you know, it may be, it may be both. <laughs> it may be, may be both. But uh, I'd say on the oil, pay attention to geopolitics. Car culture, I don't, you know, you know, I think most people want to keep their cars. And <laughs> I, I just, I mean, I don't, you know, may want to change it. But uh, it's easier if you either start with new cities or you have uh, old cities that were pre-car culture. It's hard for a country where our cities were sort of shaped by cars. Like, like to, Machu Picchu or something? Yeah, my, well, I was, <laughs> I was thinking Florence. I was thinking Florence. Anyway, thank you all. It's great. Well, thank, thank you, Paul. Dan, thank you for your... Uh,